My father's strong brown hand gently cupping my face, eating raw mangoes sprinkled with salt and chili powder with my friends in India. My grandfather sitting in his lungi at the dining table with his foot up on the chair, lying with my mother on her bed watching Hindi movies. These are some of my most cherished memories of home. I was born in Pakistan to Bangladeshi parents, but I grew up in India where my father worked. When he retired, we moved back to, to Bangladesh where my extended family lived. I am the youngest in a really tight-knit family, the baby, the only girl. And until I was 18, I often slept with my parents, finding comfort in that closeness. We took co-sleeping to a whole new level back then. <laughs> By this point, my father had sent my two older brothers to, to colleges in the United States. But for some weird reason, my parents wanted me to settle down with a nice Bangladeshi boy. I wasn't having any of that. <laughs> I had dreams of freedom, independence, conceivably being the South Asian Christian Amanpour. <laughs> so when I was admitted to the graduate program in journalism at Indiana University Bloomington, my parents reluctantly let me go. I promised I'd be back in two years. I promised the same to my Sri Lankan boyfriend who lived in Dhaka. I'd imagined a future with him. So in 1991, I traveled to the US with my two suitcases, a backpack, my green Bangladesh passport tucked safely inside a cloth purse around my neck, and my grandfather's prized possession, a pair of thermal long johns. <laughs> they were itchy and had the whole male crotch thing going, <laughs> but they served me well that first winter in the Midwest. <laughs> I was 21. Having lived in three countries, I imagined I was cosmopolitan enough to thrive in the West, not imagining that I would suffer from culture shock. But South Asia is very different from Indiana, <laughs> beginning with the food. We didn't have the kind of dorm food you have here at, I, at uh, UMass and Amherst College. I doused everything with Tabasco and gained the obligo obligatory 15 pounds snacking on Little Debbie's and ice cream. I'm a Bengali, I have a sweet tooth. But I had gone from a majority brown area to, an all, to a mainly white town. I didn't seek comfort in hanging out with the few South Asians I met on campus who had formed their own community. I wanted a different experience. Standing out didn't really bother me in the beginning until I realized that with my dark skin, British English, and thick Indian accent that I was considered either exotic or suspect. And I didn't really realize what racism was until the first time a salesperson at Target refused to help me but watched me like a hawk. I soon realized that Indiana was the hotbed of Ku Klux Klan activity. Before I had time to really settle down, I got bad news from home. Nimal had died in a car accident. None of the friends I had made really understood what I was feeling. Even I didn't know what I was feeling. I just wanted to die. But I survived like most 20-year-olds do, 21-year-olds do. I partied and I drank. I wish I'd known back then that I'd had access to counseling. I also struggled with the pressures of graduate school. I wasn't used to the challenges and how they expected you to be original and ask questions here. I was accustomed to rote learning. I don't think the professors could conceive of how foreign students like me couldn't make that leap and the kind of support we needed. I also slowly found my dreams of being a reporter 
gradually going away. My reporting 101 professor seemed to treat me differently than he did the mainly white students. He was unsympathetic with my struggles, seemed to find my questions annoying, and couldn't seem to understand, and was disdainful of the way I, I questioned the, the bias of the Western media. But I gradually made some friends, and my best friend Jessica is still in my life, but I struggled a lot and felt adrift a lot because I really miss my parents. In those days of expensive long distance calls, the main form of communications was letters. My strongest ally and my thesis advisor, Professor Jane Rhodes, a black woman who seemed to understand why I wanted to focus on the way the third world is perceived in the US media. She guided me to the finish line with firmness, kindness, and good humor. After I graduated, I moved to New York where my brother Farhad lived, and eventually I moved into an apartment in the city with a roommate on the Upper East Side. I was starting to feel like I fit in more. There were more Bangladeshis there, literally at every corner. Most of the fruit vendors were Bangladeshi, and I came home with a lot of good deals. <laughs> I had also, I had started working at Seventeen Magazine, pop culture mecca. I so slowly realized that I knew the difference between Britney Spears and Jessica Simpson, <laughs> and which boy band heartthrob each one was dating. I had arrived, I was an insider, what could go wrong? <laughs> Another phone call at midnight, my father had died. The sense of guilt intensified, my mother should not have had to deal with this alone. Like many immigrants, I struggle with the sense of loss and feeling divided and justifying the benefits of living in the US with the constant heartache. I continued to work at uh, Seventeen Magazine for a few more years where I eventually became copy chief. And I was at the office on 9-11 and watched the horror unfold on TV. I remember hearing a, an editor saying, it's those damn Arabs, and thinking to myself, please, please don't let them be Muslim. I managed to get a message out to friends and family before the internet went down. But all of that day, my mother thought I had died. Until that point, I hadn't really worried much about being Muslim. But now people seem stronger in their hatred. For almost three months, I walked 50 blocks to work because I was terrified of public transportation. Because of the way I imagined that people perceived me, a brown-skinned person, a threat, one of them. I'd always had trouble re-entering the US on my passport, but now it was worse. I was always pulled aside, questioned, searched. I can still remember and feel the fear and heartbreak one time at JFK when I was interrogated past midnight. My companion in the room was an elderly Indian lady in a sari. She was lying on a bench with her ankle chained to it. Ten years ago, I became a US citizen. And although I've been in the US for almost three decades, I constantly question, about, I constantly wonder about where home is. Home used to be with my parents, but now I've been married for 18 years to a good man, my strongest supporter. We have built a really full life, first in New York and now in Amherst. We're raising a strong brown girl in this scary racist world, cheering at soccer games, attending school events, staying involved in local politics. 
John whipping up sushi or coco vin on a Sunday evening while making collages. My Sophia, my horse crazy Sophia, cantering around our front yard or sitting at a table with her nose in a book. That's home to me now. I've come to realize that I'll always have a foot in two worlds, east and west. Always, often feeling like I never quite belong in either, but knowing that I can navigate both pretty well. Thank you.